I need to begin in a strange way today and in a very personal way. First, this is a difficult speech for me. As other people in this room, I knew Fowler well, and I still miss him. And that missing creates a space that requires that one acts constantly politically. The missing, the feeling of loss, is useless unless one recommits oneself to what Paolo spent his entire life doing. So this is difficult emotionally for me because it asks Michael, have you followed Paolo? And the answer is yes, as best as I can. And no, because no one can do what Paolo did. We can try. There's a second reason that is difficult for me, and that is because I am here in a place where my government created murderous acts. So I must begin with an apology, since my government, in the belly of the beast called the United States, has never truthfully said what must be said. And I assure you that Donald Trump will not say it. He will arm more bombers to bomb more dark-complected people and say he is defending democracy. Well, the Chicago boys thought they were defending democracy too. And at this university and in this city and so many others, people died because of my nation, not just yours. So I will begin with the apology that my government has never given in recognition that we are remembering someone who gave and sacrificed for the project of democracy that my nation wants to interrupt. So let me begin there, knowing it is painful to be from the belly of the beast in a time when we are honoring someone who understood the beast and spent his life trying to interrupt it. All right? In some ways, it is a pleasure to be here, though, because not only are we honoring a friend of many of us, but it's also a pleasure because I am somewhere where Donald Trump is not. <laughs> so at the end of this, if you wish to thank me, all I ask is that you send a visa from Chile to the person who resides in the White House and invite him to come to Chile and to have him placed in the strongest jail cell you possibly can so that he remembers what it is like to be the resident in the White House, but not anyone's legitimate president. So with that said, let me go on now. You'll forgive me, I have a very bad sense of humor, and those of you who know me know that I use it poorly. But as part of my biography that some of you know, I spent many years teaching in slums and in rural areas, trying to do critical pedagogic work. And my first three years were in the slum schools of the, you know, in the city where I was born. I'm the first generation finishing secondary school in my family. And the reason I am here is because of teachers who recognize that someone who grew up poor with critical understanding could become something that no one in his family ever dreamed of. So I spent many, many years teaching in these slum schools. And my first three years was at what we call a substitute teacher, where I would call up the Ministry of Education and they would tell me where to go. So every day I had a new class. And my name, mi nombre es Miguel Manzana. <laughs> and when you walk into a class every day that is new and you say, good morning, youth, children, and you say, me amo Miguel Manzana. <laughs> it will take four days for the children to get off the light fixtures and come down and stop laughing hysterically. 
So I will occasionally attempt to be humorous, to humanize epistemological points, and Paolo will applaud. But do not misinterpret my points. This is deadly serious. But teaching that is inhuman, that denies all of us the right also to smile, to remember our histories, is counter-hegemonic, since neoliberalism is an attempt to create new identities for all of us and historical amnesia of what it means to do education. And I refuse to participate in that, as I know most of us here also refuse. So laugh a little bit when I try to be humorous. Smile, at least, because otherwise I will keep trying. And I assure you that is not what you want. So, critical education is under attack. There has never been a time when Paolo's work has been more important. Not just neoliberals, but a new hegemonic bloc, as Gramsci reminds us. A new alliance is changing our identities, attacking what counts as education, making it into simply training for an economy that has no jobs for them with respect and pay. And this is a group that has told people that they wish to be democratic and critical as well. But the task of the new agenda, now with Pineda back here, and Trump in the White House, and Urban in Hungary, and Erdogan in Turkey, and did I mention Trump? Um, their task is to change our understanding of what democracy is. So democracy, if we were to take Paolo's work, is fully participatory. Knowledge comes from below. Knowledge is not an individual act. It is a collective act. It carries its history and its struggles with us it opens doors to remember and to act. And without the collective memory to remember who we are and whose shoulders we stand on and the debts that we owe collectively, there can be no critical education. But the task of newly dominant groups is to change that idea of democracy, to not restore the, com the conversation, but to deny the possibility of that conversation. So, if we were to have a discussion about what we would count as a critically democratic school, it would be counter-hegemonic. It would demand that the truth be told. It would demand that it be seen as collective. It would demand that it would be recognized. And if those demands weren't met, there would be strikes, demonstrations, as the youth in Chile constantly demonstrate by their strikes, as we constantly demonstrate when we protest against the destruction of philosophy as a legitimate subject area in the secondary schools of this nation, the same philosophy that gave Paolo the ability to speak truth to power. So we are still in this. Well, the new understanding of democracy is possessive individualism, as long as I have mine, it is Adam Smith without ever having read Adam Smith. My favorite quote in all of economics, this may surprise you, and it must never leave this room. Please do not tell anyone that Apple said this. But my favorite quote is not from Capital. It is not from the Grandrisse. It is not from Karl Marx. And it is not from Paulo Freire. It is from Adam Smith. In 313, that page, in A Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith reminds us, under capitalism, for every one rich person, we must create 500 poor ones. Now, his arithmetic was very, very bad. It is for every one rich person, we need one million poor Chileans, poor people in the United States, poor people in Turkey, poor people in Brazil, and those who speak back in Brazil will lose their positions as president, especially if they are a woman. 
but we can talk about that later. Since neoliberalism and this alliance is a gendered form of attack and a raced form of attack. So they want choice on a market. So democracy is choice between public schools and private schools. And the public sector is bad and lazy and any teacher, critical or not critical, must be disciplined. It's Foucault. Must be disciplined so that they show that they are making entrepreneurs of themselves. That a good education is determined by test scores, not by dialogue. It is the most anti-Paolo one could possibly get. So in the United States, under Obama, not under Trump, teachers are not paid for more for the higher test scores that their students earn. And we already know that teachers who teach in wealthy schools get higher test scores. So we are advancing an agenda that Adam Smith would be delighted in, except that Adam Smith's next book was The Moral Dilemmas of Capitalism, understanding that neoliberal agendas and the agendas of capitalism are destructive to the vast majority of people in the world. Paolo understood this much better than many other people. But it is not just neoliberals in charge of this. It is neoconservatives who believe we must restore a common culture to Chile, to Brazil, to Argentina, to the United States, an act of what Pierre Bourdieu would call an act of symbolic violence. In Chile, in the United States, in Paulo's Brazil, there has never been a common culture. Brazil, Chile, the United States are vast experiments in motion. And the task of education is to equip people to criticize where that river is going, to push the river back on its banks, to transform an education so that it allows people, it forces the state to recognize the voices of real people speaking back, giving them the power and emancipatory possibilities that say that knowledge that you call common has no place in that text for me. It is inherently democratic. There is a third group besides neoliberals and neoconservatives that we might call authoritarian populists. This is a religious group of people that believe, as Paolo did, there is insight in the knowledge of something beyond myself. Let us remember that Paolo studied for the priesthood and is one of the founders in some ways of a pedagogy that we call liberation theology. It is godly to emancipate. And whether he became a believer or not, it was fully about, I quote from him, Michael always remember that Jesus may have been one of the first communists. That's an interesting statement. It may have been rhetorical, but it was brilliant in reminding us that religion can be a source of liberatory form. It is not now, as I remember, many of the people who supported the dictatorship and its murderous policies here in Chile called themselves deeply religious. And in my own nation, the fastest growing education is not democratic, it is homeschooling, where people who are religiously committed to deeply conservative forms have said we must not allow our children to be polluted by critical understandings. I quote from them, black people bear the mark of Cain. God made them inferior. It reminds me of what happened to the Machuchi in this nation as well. I'll try and offend everyone at least once. If I haven't, would you let me go? Let me know. I'm very good at it. Okay? All right. Okay. There is a fourth group that bears even more on Paolo's work. They have their own epistemological and political forms, and that group is what we might call the professional and managerial new middle class. And they believe one simple thing 
The only knowledge that is important is that which shows up on tests in public and private schools. So if it moves in our classrooms, measure it. And if it hasn't moved yet, measure the damn thing again and again and again. So we are involved in what might be called an epistemological war in which Palos claims that knowledge of the people are the fundament of everything that must go on in education is denied. In essence, the role of education is to be a vast accounting system in which what counts as important and legitimate knowledge in the curriculum is that only which can be measured. So history, voice, philosophy is demonized. It is seen as unimportant, useless. It is not useful for economic mobilization. To give one example, something that you will recognize here, the, pr the president, in quotes, the president, prime minister of Japan, Abe, has declared that all schools and universities should stop to deny any major in philosophy, sociology, history, language, comparative literature, critical pedagogy. Why are we paying for them? They do not help the economy. In my own state, the state of Wisconsin, that has the history of being supposedly America's socialism, we can talk about that later. They have told universities now that we must do exactly the same thing. So at one of the branches of the university, quite a powerful one, the majors and the students and the professors will no longer study philosophy, sociology, literature, and any course that has things called ethnic studies in it. That is the history of indigenous people, the history of working class and poor people. This will be denied. So we are facing a powerful epistemological war. And that war is based on what Gramsci understood as the difference between a war of position and a war of maneuver. Will you forgive me from quoting from someone who is slightly political, but Gramsci was brilliant. And he said the following, modern wars of ideology are very different than before. A modern war does not look like World War I, where the rector sits over there and has his troops facing me, and Michael has his troops facing the rector, and the rector yells charge, and Michael yells charge, and whoever is left standing wins. It's a frontal attack. And Gramsci reminds us that current ideological struggles, struggles over culture and memory, what was so important for Paolo is what Gramsci calls a war of position, the war over everything, curriculum, teaching, the consciousness of real people in real life. And what the right has done is to understand Gramsci profoundly by reminding us profoundly that the struggle over people's understanding of their identities, who they are, what they believe in, is absolutely central to social transformation. In essence, the right has said, we've already answered the question whether education can change society, something that Paolo took as his lifeblood. And the right has said, we understand Paolo better than anyone else. We will change your ideas about who you are. We will change what education is for. We will change how we do it so you no longer even remember that there was someone called Paolo Freire. To give you a sense of what is going on about this, I'm certain that you have heard that the Congress in Brasilia, that many members are ready to vote to take away the honors that were given of Paulo as a universal Brazilian citizen. That will be removed. So all of this is going on simultaneously. So knowledge for Paulo comes from below. It is a collective project. But we must remember not to romanticize this. I had many debates with Paulo about this. He is my teacher, but a good teacher loves to argue. 
and my debates with Paolo changed me massively. But I need to do a little Gramsci here. Paolo reminded us that knowledge, that people are never totally conditioned, but there are always elements of insight in people's daily lives. In essence, he also understood Gramsci and understood that consciousness is contradictory. People who are poor are not puppets. People in rural areas understand what is happening in their lives. And any epistemological program that denies their insights into the reality that they are facing will fail. So knowledge comes from their experience. But let us remember Gramsci's point, and this to me is absolutely central, that elite knowledge, what we call elite knowledge now, is also paid for already by working groups, by people in the slums and favelas, by women doing unpaid domestic labor in the homes, by indigenous people who understand their land has been lost, that this nation has been bought over the bodies, like my own, of enslaved people and people who are indigenous. And that knowledge, history, mathematics, statistics, science, is already paid for by the surplus labor of real people in real communities, paid and unpaid. That knowledge is theirs. It must never be taken away. It has been paid for by their bodies and their lives. Let me give an example of that. Here are the notes for my lecture. We can say that's simply a technical form. Michael Apple walked into his office in the teacher education building at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I walked up the stairs, and I walked into my office, and I turned on the lights, and I turned on the computer, and the computer went on. Fine. So Michael Apple brings his notes to bore more people in Chile. Okay? So, but that is not what happened. Yes, I walked into the teacher education building. Yes, I walked up the stairs. Yes, I opened the door. Yes, I turned on the light and it went on. Yes, I turned on the computer and it went on. And in my city, we burn coal to produce electricity. So in order for me to give a hymn, a memorial, to someone who is the teacher of so many of us in this room, I now had an anonymous social relationship with the miners who died or were badly injured, who got black lung disease, in order for that my computer to go on. They paid with this, for this, with their lives. I have a debt I must fully repay. It is what we call, in epistemology, the act of repositioning and doing relational analysis. I must see the world, as Paolo did, through the eyes of the oppressed. And I must pay that debt as much as I can. So epistemological questions become political questions about what are the debts we owe, and also who is the we. And for Paolo, the we must be much more inclusive than anything that the government of my own nation or of this nation understands. But that means, as Gramsci reminds us, that it is not just the knowledge that comes from the people and their daily lives that counts, but it's knowledge that they have also paid for. Why is it, for instance, that mathematics is seen as elite knowledge? Why is it that science is seen as elite knowledge? When Paolo would claim Gramsci would claim it has already been paid for. There is already within indigenous communities profound understandings of nature and mathematics. In fact, the first mathematics comes from indigenous communities. What gives the United States the right to say, for instance, that we are a nation that is formed, if you will, by the entrepreneurial spirit that Mr. Trump wants to bring back. 
when it is a nation that would have no economy whatsoever without the knowledge and burden borne by enslaved people. How is it that the United States has the right to say it is a Christian nation when in fact we know that one fourth of all the enslaved people stolen from Africa were Muslim and spoke Arabic and were quite literate in Arabic mathematics? How is it possible that we have forgotten that? That knowledge which comes from archeologists and anthropologists at universities is already paid for by indigenous people. We have a debt to pay so that in order for me to get on a plane at an airport in my own nation, I must understand that that airport has been built by people, all right? Just as the miners worked to dig the coal for these notes to be made. So we cannot talk about Paolo's epistemology unless we talk about the debt that he understood that epistemological questions were questions about power and where knowledge comes from and the debt that must be paid. Now, I've been talking abstractly and politically, but I want to give you two examples of what this means, in which Paolo's work is still living in the United States as well as here. And it's a story about what is called the algebra project. So I purposely pick a subject that most people in the United States and in Europe and also in Brazil and elsewhere say, we can do this for literacy. I mean, Paolo was a literacy worker, but we can't do it for those real subjects like mathematics and science. Those are too technical. So let us confine ourselves to those feminized subjects that are less important, I quote. This is the algebra project in a city of Baltimore in Maryland on the East Coast, right near Washington, DC, the home of that resident. I can't resist. Okay. Okay. And the mathematics educators have been, they've all read Paolo Ferrari. Many of them have been in my classes and they're using my book with James Bean called the Escuelas Democraticas. And they know that if they keep teaching mathematics the way it is usually taught, 90% of those black and brown children will fail. They know that. So they decide that they must start out with a dialogue that will make mathematics powerful and connected to children's, children's, youth's lives. These are 13, 14, and 15-year-old youth, all youth of color, about to drop out of school. They are angry and alienated and will not stand to be failed once again. And anyone who is taught in real schools knows that this is the case for many students who have been told that they are stupid. In the same way, the peasants, in quotes, that Paolo worked with said that schooling was not for them. So what did these teachers do? They asked the students, what are the social problems that concern them the most? And after four days of dialogue, there was a vote, and it was that they are about in the city to build a new prison that will incarcerate even more poor youth of color. Already, one out of every four young black men in my own state is in prison now. So for them, their future was imprisonment. So the people in the algebra project, algebra project, what is seen as alien, I quote now, white knowledge. They used the knowledge that they were getting to do research on the following topics. Who gets arrested and who does not? By what frequency? They're using their mathematics. Who gets bail? Who gets released? Do white people also do the same crimes? What happens to them? They don't get arrested. They get let go. Okay. How much will it cost to build a new prison? Who will have the jobs? Who will not? Where is the money coming from? It comes from the education and women's health budgets. 
their mathematics then, the project was to go public to work with critical journalists who were also influenced by Paolo and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, something we forget about. It was not only in education. And they worked with the Occupy movement, with community groups, with critical literacy experts, and they were on television every week. And the ultimate result of Paolo Freire's work in critical mathematics, elite knowledge, was that the prison was not built at all. And at the same time, the money was given back to schools, to critical pedagogues in the community, to literacy work with immigrants, etc. So let us remember that while Paolo worked epistemologically and in terms of literacy over knowledge from below, we must never deny the right of poor people and oppressed people, the knowledge that white people in the United States get, that middle class people in the United States get. So we must expand the epistemological forms that Paolo so brilliantly had his life devoted to, to also ask the existing knowledge that is called elite must also be given back in ways that make a difference in people's lives. Otherwise, I can guarantee that the students will do very poorly on the test, and this will be a grave danger. So, so far I've been quite complimentary, but I want to talk about the dangers of this as well. I need to be honest. And you may disagree now with what I say, and you may have disagreed before, but the task of critical pedagogues as I learned from Paolo, was profoundly to not only accept criticism, but to welcome it. If knowledge is collective, it is done through dialogue where people learn from each other. So there is a danger of romanticizing knowledge from below. One of the things that the right has shown powerfully is that below doesn't necessarily mean that it is progressive, that it is committed to social transformation. So I work in favelas in Brazil, and I heard things from oppressed people I never thought I would ever hear again. I quote, it was better under the dictatorship. I didn't know whether to commit suicide, to cry, or to simply say, did I hear you correctly? Perhaps the translator was wrong. One of the things the right has proven through the election of Donald Trump, Panetta, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro, who was an ultra-conservative, anti-feminist racist, that there is no guarantee, no guarantee that knowledge from below will open itself up to emancipatory politics. That is actually what makes Paolo's work so important. It is hard work. It is not automatic. It is a long-term political and pedagogic project. And the right has spent 30 years engaging in that pedagogic project. So we must understand that Paolo's work has been colonized by the right, that reaches into people's consciousness and connects with ways that are extraordinarily powerful. So let us not romanticize an epistemological form that says, as long as I work from below, everything will be fine. If we are not in this for the long term, what Raymond Williams so brilliantly called the long revolution, we will lose. And that is the most disrespectful thing you can do to Paolo. For him, it was not a method that can be used. It is a commitment that goes on forever. And his life documented that. There is another danger. And that danger is that we academicize the political rather than politicize the academic. It becomes one more damn thing we study at the university, but we don't put it into practice. I will give one example of that. My wife, Rima, Professor Rima Apple, who is in women's studies and history of medicine, and I 
spend a lot of time in China. We are professors in China and work with dissident groups in China. My work is now on the national teacher examination. It is used to sort and select so people memorize Paolo Freire and memorize Michael Apple and memorize all these things for the test. I don't think that's a victory. It's a partial victory because I want people to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed in its Chinese version, which I assure you is very different. It is not half as critical as anything you would expect. Well, you might expect it wouldn't be critical. But is that a victory or a defeat? That pedagogy of the oppressed or ideology and curriculum and education and power is memorized for an education that dismisses the possibility of critical pedagogy. That is a real danger. So I don't know what counts as success now in this. It is a gain that we are revisiting our teacher. It is an immense gain to have his handwriting there. It is embodied. So now will we test people on, was the handwriting legible? What did he say that was different? Will it be just on a test? And too often in universities, we forget that our role is not simply to teach it, but to practice it. He demanded that. There is one last and that is that critical pedagogy is captured by the new middle class. It becomes one more thing that we teach for professional mobility within the academy, but that's all it becomes. And in the United States now, if someone were to ask me as one of the founders of critical pedagogy in the United States, am I still a critical pedagogue? I must say yes, but not as it's constituted. It has become one more way for people to write in the United States seemingly radical books, and the only radical thing they do is add a typewriter. What gives Paolo his power is not the brilliance and lasting quality of his work, but Paolo as a human being who reminded us constantly of the sacrifices from Brazil to moving to Chile, to the death threats, to the jail terms that were always on offer. We honor his epistemological claims. We honor his person. We honor the people who have devoted their life to keeping his work influential and alive. We honor that by becoming more like him. And on that note, let me thank publicly you for keeping it alive, you for being here, and you for understanding he may not be here physically, but he is alive, and I hope well, for centuries to come. Thank you.